hey, Freddie, thanks for sitting down with me uh, and really appreciate you involving me and, and Digital Ventures more broadly. We had a team participating in the Beat to Hemp Pandemic uh, Hackathon last weekend. So thank you very much. And thanks for taking the time to sit down today. Thanks for having me. Uh, you know, I wanted to have a conversation with you. I think I came out of the, uh, the hackathon just really energized about how many people were involved and, and, and just how you got it all together. Could, could you tell me a bit about the, the origin story uh, for this virtual hackathon? Yeah, so it actually started uh, kind of organically. There's a colleague of mine who's a MBA student at Sloan. Um, he had been involved with uh, a startup, and you know, at, during that time, this was about three weeks ago, around mid March or so, when you know students were being sent home, or, you know, campuses were closing down, research labs were about to start getting closed down across the campus, and we both independently quickly recognized that there was really this large untapped um, pool of people of you know really talented, really bright people uh, who now were going to be idle, who now were going to yeah. be facing in this sense of helplessness, wanting to do something but not knowing how or where to to channel those um, um, those efforts towards. Um, whereas on the other side, uh, from the cloud core perspective, you had all of these unmet problems and needs uh, left and right uh, everywhere that you turn. And so, you know, that's how, uh, you know, we thought that a virtual hackathons, well, virtual in a sense, because obviously there was no way we could bring people together when isolation uh, orders were coming down the pipeline. So. Um, you know, where we thought the virtual hackathons could really bring together the people who could help solve the problems and the people who were having the problems together uh, towards COVID-19. And I think you know, that's where it started. Uh, we started contacting um, various groups uh, within the MIT community because um, that was also one initial way that we wanted to coalesce the MIT community behind mm -hmm. the unifying effort because that's really what we do at MIT is, you know, when there's a problem, we're here to try and figure out how to solve it. So now uh, and so in those just very first few days we were able to get a multitude of the various mit uh, groups especially in the innovation and entrepreneurship sp you know, space right at mit uh, together um and then i started reaching out to some of uh the network that um in the larger broader um, healthcare innovation ecosystem um and uh, some of the things that we recognize that we definitely had to adapt this to be different from just a traditional hackathon or even a traditional or any of these other virtual hackathons that popped up all over the place uh, since then. And I think there's really three main ways that we've differentiated. One is that we knew that we probably couldn't get the propensity of hospital workers and providers at our hackathon mm -hmm. the way we normally would. Right. So we had to find a way to do rest that. So the way we did that was we forged uh, partnerships with our clinical partners um, to be our um, helpless in sourcing of the problems, prioritizing the problems from the front lines. Um, but the other part of it is that we, you know, basically asked them that they had to also look on the implementation side of the equation too, to figure out where can they streamline, optimize, remove the unnecessary hurdles so that once there is a good idea that comes out of the hackathon, gets developed to enough of a maturity uh, and robustness stage that there's nothing else holding it back from being implemented by the mm -hmm. hospital system or by the clinician. The second part was doing a series of virtual hackathons as opposed to just a one-off um, type of hackathon, mostly because we wanted to ensure that we were staying hyper-focused on the problems of today, of the problems of now. Um, and the problems that are today, hopefully are not the problems two weeks from now or four weeks from now, and vice versa, the problems a month from now may not even be on our radar today. Right. The third aspect, which is an equal focus on the hackathon itself and what happens after the hackathon. And there it's because, you know, many people often ask, well, okay, well, what comes out after the hackathon? What happens after that? Um, and so, you know, there's not many uh, other spaces where there's that equal focus. And we wanted to, again, make sure that we had a very, as much of a robust pipeline as we could to go from that initial uh, viable concept and early prototype into something that is robust and mature yeah. enough that can be used by the clinician or the hospital and not break down on its second use or third use of uh, the implementation. Absolutely.
And and how do you think you got so many people involved so quickly? I mean, I, the numbers were staggering. 4,500 people applied, 1,500 participants. I, I don't remember how many, uh, you know, mentors and judges on top of that. It seemed like a few hundred. Uh, but how did you how did you get such a group together in such a short period of time? I mean, I think there it's both the you know, tapping into that, those critical aspects, as I mentioned, we had a lot of people who were, again, idle and, and helpless and really looking for an outlet to mm -hmm. uh, do something in COVID-19. The second part was, um, you know, I think being lucky, being at MIT and being, having been with uh, Hacking Medicine as well, like the network that's been, uh, it's through both of those entities in terms of galvanizing our network of partners uh, towards this cause mm -hmm. uh, to many of them it was basically a no-brainer uh, and so they were able to activate very quickly as well so i think it was a combination of the two that you know essentially we had uh, an existing uh, network that we could build upon and then secondly again it's really fulfilling that unmet need and you know, I think it was also at the right time as well, because, you know, if we had been a little bit earlier, a little bit later, yeah. um, that would have been a little bit different. But, you know, even the methodology that people know Hacking Medicine for um, is really what also differentiates us from a lot of the other virtual hackathons as well, which may be more software development driven. Right. Uh, don't take into account that whole problem definition aspect, really understanding the needs and the problem at hand before even tackling the, the solution aspect, um, figuring out the different stakeholders involved and how to align the incentives for all those stakeholders and the solution they're building. So, um, but uh, yeah, it was pretty amazing to see not just the number of partners that came together. I think it's over 40 plus across every spectrum of the, innovation ecosystem from the clinical side to pharma, big tech, to uh, incubators, accelerators, venture right. sites. So, um, but the 4,500 participants that applied to be a part of this uh, came from 96 countries and 49 wow. states across the U.S. So it's really, it was a global effort um, in that sense. And it's, you know, even on the mentor side, we had, I think, over 500 applications for people to be mentors. Um, but we only had the capacity for 1,500 participants and 250 mentors ultimately mm -hmm. um, spread across 10 different tracks or problem spaces. And with, and they, the participants ended up forming, I believe, 238 teams overall. Um, mm -hmm. and so that's pretty amazing to see that scale happen so quickly. Yeah, well, one of the things you didn't mention was the hustle, Freddie. I mean, you were, I know, me personally, only one of the 40 partners, you were still texting me almost every day. I, and I know you're working full time as a physician and still pulling that off is just so impressive. And uh, and thank you for, for, for that hustle. Um, I am curious about, you know, you talk about pulling all these people together. So, you know, once you got into the hackathon, how did you do it? What tools did you use? How were you able to coordinate across that many people, that many different time zones, uh, you know, different types of people, team participants, mentors, judges, the organizers, et cetera? Yeah, I mean, as you can imagine, and this is probably true of everyone who's been trying to figure out how do you virtualize the normal live environment of anything you do, right? Whether mm -hmm. it's working uh, in your normal job, whether it's conferences, whether it's... So for us, we had to face very similar questions as well. How do you virtualize a hackathon altogether? Um, so the tools we ultimately end up using, which is, you know, as you might can imagine, Slack and Zoom and mm -hmm. um, some use of... Google as well, but I think uh, those were the two mainstays. And I think um, surprisingly, both worked fairly well uh, throughout the whole event. Uh, no technical failures as far as we know about. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it was, you know, both, there were both tools that were fairly intuitive, um, even though, you know, some people I know who used uh, Slack for their first time, like it was fairly quick for them to pick up, mostly because we just set the right infrastructure in place there um, in terms of how to navigate the Slack and how to keep a little bit of order in that organized chaos. Uh, so what, can you offer a specific of what setting the right infrastructure actually means? Like what's a, what's a you know, a, a trick or tip that you would offer to, to people that you found I mean, effective? The most basic thing is, you know, being very clear to the users or the participants on, you know, how do you interface or interact with the different um, 
some groups of people on uh, in the workspace now you know how do you how does a participant team to a mentor interaction happen? How does a participant team to one of our partners interaction happen? Uh, whether those are individual channels that are dedicated to the partners, whether that's a sort of mentor queuing queue process that we had where participants could pose a question that would get posted within a channel or within a, a Google Sheet that would then go yeah. into a channel that the mentors could access. Um, but similarly, how they interface with the organizing team as well. So. Uh, so it's kind of laying those ground rules uh, from the start to be very clear, but then just a very simplistic nomenclature of how channels are created and what they have the naming structures should be so that it's very clear what a partner channel is versus what a team channel is, or even, you know, how, you know, we ask mentors to, you know, in their name field, for example, not just to list their name, but to actually list their name and their uh, the institution or the company they're from and then right. and they're a mentor, right? Like those small little tidbits. Um, you know, help tons. Um, some mentors even took the added uh, uh, part of adding the expertise that they brought to the table too, especially if they came from an entity that wasn't necessarily as clear cut as to what they were bringing to the table to help the teams. Yeah, interesting. The standards of communication can make a huge difference. Yeah. It's having the right language can really facilitate speed. Um, so I, how has this experience, you know, for you informed now, you know, what's possible? in terms of being able to use these tools differently and galvanize such a large group of people so quickly. Um, how, are, how are you taking this and, and you know, are able to kind of move it forward, uh, both for your, uh, you know, future virtual hackathons, because you did mention this is a series, as well as, you know, beyond. So, you know, I, I would say there, there's a few different aspects. Um, I think one is that it's really, we always knew the power of hackathons were great at bringing people together from different parts of the spectrum, different parts of the ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And um, especially at MIT, you know, we think that anybody that has interfaced with the healthcare system can have a meaningful impact with them uh, in, in changing that space and innovating in that space. And so, um, and that literally means everybody because every single one of us has been a patient at one point or has had a loved one who's um, been in the hospital or has been a patient. So, uh, and we all have a different perspective to add. Uh, so I think that's been one uh, reaffirming uh, notion that we've had through this virtual hackathon is that truly, again, anybody from whether they're from India or whether they're from Singapore or from um, Pakistan can still have an impact on the healthcare system here in the U.S. and yep. uh, our responses. So um, I think the second aspect has been this global nature and this communal community aspect um, that uh, not just the hackathon itself, but that MIT generally has had great success of doing is being this neutral convener of uh, a community uh, to be passionate behind problem solving and problem yeah. solving this place against COVID-19. So, um, so I think those are two, um, you know, I, I would say probably not too many other institutions can fall into that realm of things uh, or categories to uh, facilitate that. So to me, you're asking me what are, well, what's the next set of possibilities? And I think they really are endless and limitless. Um, you know, the fact that so many people galvanize so quickly and activated and mobilized so quickly, um, you know, from the individual to major corporations uh, yeah. was phenomenal. And if we can do that, uh, how can we continue to do that uh, even after the pandemic and COVID-19 is over with, right? How do we continue to see, do, facilitate the interactions that we're seeing now virtually be long lasting, right? Um, it shouldn't take something of this magnitude to motivate us to accelerate innovation and development. Uh, medicine in general has always been a very conservative and slow moving industry, um, but it doesn't need to be. Um, so I would love to see that continue and see. And so, you know, if we can, if we can show success of going from initial idea, you know, from a group of people who've never met each other before that weekend to an idea that gets implemented and gets used within a few weeks or even yeah. a couple months, you know, possibilities are endless. While they're scattered across the globe, yes. right? 
yes. and across all the 24 times. <laughs> so. yes. yes. Yeah. Agreed. Well, well said, Freddie. Uh, thank you for the time. I, you know, I was so inspired by, uh, you know, being able to participate. Uh, really looking forward uh, to the rest of the series uh, and certainly, you know, working with the teams uh, and beyond and uh, to see, you know, how all of this innovation really evolves and develops. So thank you for all that you do and thank you for the time today. Yeah, well, thanks, Nick, for uh, not only helping support and spreading the word about what we're doing, of course, uh, uh, and participating yourself as a judge for the event, and of course, having BCG Digital Ventures and the team participate as well. I hope they have as much fun in this process as you did, but hopefully also are continuing to work it. on their idea as well. Oh, yeah, they loved it. <laughs> they loved it. We're still meeting about it. Yeah, so thank you. Enjoy the awesome. day. Bye-bye. Thanks, Nate. Take care.